Hey everyone, happy Halloween. Everyone knows that Halloween is very scary and spooky and kind of a lighthearted and fun sort of way. But unfortunately, over the years, a lot of very real, very grisly crimes have also taken place on the holiday. Let's take a look at a few of those. This case is easily one of the most stupid I've ever come across. I mean, I guess it could be scary in a sort of, wow, people are insane, sort of scary. On Halloween back in 2011, a woman named Maria Adams, aged 49, was with her acquaintance, Liddell Peoples, aged 55. Liddell and Adams had only been friends, friends with benefits, but Liddell had fallen in love. However, her career as a sex worker had complicated things. Despite this, the two planned to spend Halloween together and had gotten some Halloween candy to share. Liddell, noticing that he couldn't find his Hershey's, Tootsie Rolls, or Jolly Ranchers, angrily confronted Maria, accusing her of stealing the candy. After a thorough search, he then found the candy in her coat pocket. She had stolen it from him. The next events are hearsay on the part of Liddell Peoples. It's impossible to verify if the sequence of events is 100% true, but it does line up with the crime scene and autopsy. Angered over his accusations of grand theft, the two broke out into an argument. At some point during the argument, Maria brandished a plate and threw it at Liddell, as if it were a murder frisbee, cutting his face just above the eye. Fueled by a hot desire for candy and revenge, Liddell proceeded to grab three steak knives from the kitchen, lunge towards Adams, and stab her over 20 times. And uh, after she was on the ground bleeding out, he proceeded to poke her with his foot to make sure that she wasn't faking it and wasn't up to anything sneaky. I can't even make a joke. This is a joke. Standing over her body, Liddell then debated on what to do. He devised two master plans. Plan A, put her body outside so someone will see it. She will get possibly very delayed help while he will get to leave the house. Plan B, just run away without doing anything. But given that they had slept together that night, the cops were sure to trace this back to him. Worrying that the police may get, quote, the wrong idea, and suspect this was attempted murder, Liddell called the police himself. The cops soon arrived to the location, with Liddell telling them, this shit is crazy, she threw a plate at my head. She died later that night in the hospital. Liddell was arrested and held on a $2 million bond, with charges of first degree murder and aggravated battery. He got 30 years in prison, which, his attorney argues, constitutes a life sentence. The judge feels the sentencing is appropriate. I shit you not, I have exaggerated nothing about this case. I'll be putting the court documents down in the description below, just because I know it's pretty unbelievable. You can read up on it yourself. And uh, funnily enough, the court case is called People vs. Peoples, which is Extremely confusing, if you didn't know the guy's name beforehand. Yoshihiro Hattori was born in Nagoya in Japan. He was a middle child, very sociable, and very energetic. He received a scholarship in order to study abroad in the U.S., where he was placed with a host family in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Two months after arriving in the country, he and his American friend, Webb, were invited to a Halloween party. It was organized for all of the Japanese exchange students in the area. The party was being held in a quiet, working-class neighborhood. Yoshi dressed in a white tuxedo while his friend covered himself in bandages. Being unsure of which house the party was being held, they ended up at the wrong place, the peers' home. There were Halloween decorations all over the house. There were three cars in the driveway. The address was only off by one number. So they hopped out of the car and went up to ring the doorbell. Excitedly, Yoshi sang in a loud voice, We're here for the party. After a few rings, nobody came to the door. 
Bonnie Pierce saw them from the side door of the house. When the kids saw her there, they started walking toward that door instead. Saying that they walked toward the door too fast, she closed the window blinds and locked the door out of fear. In court, she would say, I guess he appeared oriental. He could have been Mexican or whatever. He was taller than me, and he was darker colored. However, she would later go on to say that it was actually his walking speed that scared her so much. Either way, she ran and told her husband to get the gun. Yoshi and his friend were on their way back to the car. Mr. Pierce claimed that Yoshi was moving erratically, like a madman, and that he was laughing and smiling. Like an excited kid on Halloween? Rodney Pierce felt that he was quite imposing. Yoshi was a 16-year-old weighing 145 pounds. Is that... come on. While walking away, the boys heard a loud freeze from behind. The husband, Rodney, wasn't sure what was going on, only hearing the fear in his paranoid wife's voice. Yoshi, presumably either not hearing or not understanding the freeze command, continued walking, when he then turned around and yelled once more, We're here for the party. Webb frantically yelled for Yoshi to come back, but it was too late. Yoshi had started walking up to Rodney. Both of the boys were shot at, missing Webb, but sadly hitting Yoshi in the chest. Rodney then ran back inside and locked the door. Police didn't arrive for 40 minutes after the shooting, while Yoshi bled out on the sidewalk. Some neighbors came to help the boys, where Bonnie Piers also yelled at them to leave their property. Yoshi was thrown into an ambulance, dying on the ride to the hospital from blood loss. His friend's parents were the ones to inform his parents. The police questioned and released Rodney Piers, not charging him with any crime, saying that he was well within his rights to shoot trespassers, even if they were a couple of kids who rang your doorbell on Halloween. The Piers later said that the incident was crushing and that they felt terrible about it. However, they considered it to be a tragic accident, and they don't feel that they are at fault. Yoshi's parents soon arrived in New Orleans, their first concern being how Yoshi's friend was doing. The case became instant international news, especially in Japan. Rodney was finally charged with manslaughter after a mountain of complaints from citizens, the governor of Louisiana, and the Japanese consulate in New Orleans. Rodney testified that all he knew was that a man was coming at him from a car, fast, and didn't stop when he yelled freeze. He was acquitted. Later on, thanks to Yoshi's parents petitioning and collecting well over a million signatures in both Japan and the U.S., Congress passed a new act that required mandatory background checks on gun buyers, including a five-day waiting period when buying handguns, mostly because of this case in particular. Yoshi's mother would go on to say, We started the petition because we love America, just as Yoshi did, in hopes that the U.S. would become a safer country. Judge Brown said, regarding this case, There was no justification whatsoever that a killing was necessary for Rodney Pierce to save himself, and that any claims involving self-defense were unacceptable. The Pierce were ordered to pay $650,000 in a wrongful death suit to Yoshi's parents. When reading about this case, I just kind of wonder, like, how does this woman survive if someone coming up to her door is so threatening that she just pisses herself in fear and goes to get the gun? I mean, how is her husband not concerned by this behavior? It's Halloween. It's two younger guys saying they're looking for a party. Just tell them, wrong address, done, over, that's it. And to yell at them to freeze and threaten to shoot them when they're leaving, which is exactly what you wanted them to do, I don't get it. I don't get it. Egging is a common prank on Halloween. I don't think I really need to explain what egging is. Uh, You throw eggs at things. Surprisingly, egging has resulted in a multitude of deaths over the years. Let's look at New York specifically. In 1996, a 10-year-old boy in Brooklyn was hit by a stray bullet from a nearby gunfight resulting from an egging gone wrong. 
That previous year, two 12-year-old boys were having an egg fight, accidentally striking two nearby men with them. The men then proceeded to stab the boys. The same Halloween night, a 29-year-old man was struck by an egg. He threw a bottle back at the teens who threw it, who then later returned with a shotgun and shot him dead. There were other egging-related murder cases in New York in 1993, 1989, 1987, and 1984. From 1984 to 2010, 24 people in New York alone were killed over egging-related incidents. In 1998, a man from the Bronx, a 21-year-old computer programmer named Carl Jackson, picked up his girlfriend and her son from a Halloween party at around 11.15 p.m. While stopped, a group of kids began tossing eggs and egging his car. Carl hopped out of his car, exchanging some very heated words with the teens. However, this wouldn't be the end of it, though, as 17-year-old Curtis Sterling would hop into his car and chase after Carl, catching up to him only a couple of blocks away, when he then took out his gun. Carl was shot in the head. He was rushed to Jacoby Medical Center, but he was pronounced dead shortly after. Ironically, according to his father, Carl was always paranoid of Halloween, claiming that it was too dangerous and refusing to go out, even in his teens. However, he wanted his girlfriend's son to experience the holiday and have some fun. His mother would go on to say, We never thought that anyone from our family would be murdered, especially on a holiday, for something so stupid. Every year on Halloween, she sends a card to the murderer in prison, saying, I'm glad you're still in there. On Halloween in 2010, a 16-year-old boy named Devin Griffin returned home from church in the morning. He went up to his room to play some video games. However, by mid-afternoon, he realized the house was pretty quiet and went down to his mother's bedroom to check on them, when he would reveal a Halloween scene more horrific than any fictional story he had ever heard. Thinking it was a tasteless prank, he then found the dead bodies of his brother, his mother, and his stepfather. His stepfather and mother were in bed, with the covers pulled up over their heads. He pulled the covers down on his mom's side, seeing blood on the pillow. Still thinking it was a prank, he touched her, only to realize that this was all real. He then called the police. His stepbrother, William Lisk Jr., age 24, had come over to the family home. After drinking during a Halloween party the night before, his father was unable to drive him home. At some point after this, William Jr. had first gone into the room of his stepbrother, where he viciously beat him to death with a claw hammer. He then left the scene and went into his father's room, where he shot his father five times in the head from one or two feet away. He then sexually assaulted his stepmother, before shooting her three times in the head as well. William Jr. fled the home in the family truck and drove it to their cabin, but he was quickly caught and arrested. William Jr. had been declared legally sane, but was reportedly obviously mentally ill. He suffered from schizoaffective disorder. On the night of the crime, he had been drinking alcohol, and it's speculated that he also hadn't taken his medication. A mixture of alcohol and mental illness had been a problem in his life for some time now. He had been arrested numerous times, a few of those times after assaulting his stepmother. He had been in and out of group homes for people with mental disorders. There were various other violent outbursts where he hadn't been arrested as well. The family was warned multiple times on multiple occasions that living with William Jr. was jeopardizing their safety. However, they dismissed these claims, saying he would never do anything to hurt us. William has owned up to his actions taking full responsibility, saying that the problem was likely a result of his own mental illness. He clearly appeared to be very distraught and very regretful of his actions. He was given life in prison, but couldn't live with what he had done and killed himself in 2015. In Halloween of 1982, Marvin Brandland, age 69, and his wife were handing out Halloween candy to trick-or-treaters as they usually did. After a regular round of kids coming to the door to grab some candy, a suspicious adult knocked on the door. The man was wearing a pillowcase with eye holes over his head. He stated, trick or treat, give me your money or I'll shoot. 
Understandably thinking it was a joke, the wife, Ethel, tried to pull the pillowcase off of his head, but he held it down. She had assumed it was her granddaughter who had just left, but it was not. Still hoping for the best, she ran to get a handful of candy. To their horror, the man followed them inside and then proceeded to pull out a gun. He would then ask them to take him downstairs to the safe. Due to knowing the location of the safe, it was very likely that he was someone the family knew, given that only family members knew of the safe. Marvin, still thinking this was a prank, went to grab the gun from him. The man then shot Marvin in the throat. He then tore off the pillowcase and threw it on the floor before running out of the home. Marvin was rushed to the hospital, where he died mid-operation. A few months later, Ethel passed away as well. An unnamed man was quickly brought forth as a suspect in the case, an unnamed family friend who would have likely known of the safe. However, there wasn't any actual evidence to connect him to the crime. The police held back on arresting him, as they knew they would have no way to prove he was the perpetrator yet. The key evidence, the pillowcase, didn't have enough DNA for them to get a sample. As DNA technology continues to approve, we may one day get an update on this case. However, at this point in time, it is still unsolved. Cindy Song was an international student from South Korea who came to the U.S. in 1995. She lived with her aunt and uncle while she attended high school, and eventually graduated and went on to Pennsylvania State University, where she had a pretty good group of friends. Now a senior in college, she went to a costume party at a local nightclub called, simply, Players Nightclub, with a couple of her friends, dressed in a rabbit costume. They all stayed at the nightclub until about 2 a.m., when they left to go back to a mutual friend's apartment to play some video games. Getting tired, they left, and Cindy was finally dropped off at home around 4 a.m. She was never heard from again. In her apartment, everything seemed to be in order with no signs of forced entry. Her backpack, cell phone, and false eyelashes were all placed down as if she had just arrived home. The only things that weren't found were her driver's license and credit cards. She had vanished in her costume, as it wasn't found in her home. Her phone hadn't made or received any calls that night either. There was no activity to be found in her email or on her credit cards. A search was conducted of the immediate area, but nothing was ever found. Considering she still had tickets for an upcoming concert, and a half-complete paper that was due after Halloween, it didn't seem likely that she had planned to leave of her own will. She was also never really suicidal or even considered depressed by the people who knew her, and didn't seem at all like the kind of person who would just disappear. One theory is that she left her apartment shortly after arriving to go pick up some food and was kidnapped along the way. Others believe that she left with someone who came to her apartment after, who eventually killed her. A few days after, a woman matching her description was reported to have been seen being forced into a car by an unknown man. Nobody has ever found this man, and it's not even known if the woman was her. This occurred in Philadelphia's Chinatown area, and the man was described as an Asian male with light brown skin. A serial killer named Hugo Selensky was suspected of her murder, with the bodies of more than five other victims being found on his property, and his own accomplice accusing him of the murder of Cindy. The accomplice claimed that Selensky kept her bunny ears as a trophy, and that her body was also buried on the property. The whole property was gutted, turning up several more bodies, but none of them belonged to Cindy. Her rabbit ears were never found on the property either. Some believe he did commit the crime, whether he did or didn't, he was convicted of several other murders and is currently in prison for life either way. It's still not known what happened to Cindy, even 20 years later. This is the original big Halloween case, the one that spread rumors of poisoned Halloween candy more than ever. The man in this case is known as the man who killed Halloween, as thanks to him, more and more parents became paranoid of even letting their kids out on the holiday, all because some stranger was handing out poisoned Halloween candy. Or was he? 
In 1974, Robert O'Brien was a man living in Deer Park, Texas, with his wife and two kids. He was an optician by trade. He was also the deacon at a Baptist church where he sang in a choir and administrated the bus program. As much as he appeared to be a good old stand-up guy, Robert O'Brien was shit with money. He was over $100,000 in debt, about $520,000 by today's standards, and couldn't hold down a job to save his life, having more than 20 jobs in 10 years. At his current job at Texas State Optical, he was suspected of theft and was on the verge of being fired. His home was foreclosed upon, his car was about to be repossessed, and he had to default on several bank loans. Times weren't great. Halloween came around and he took his two kids, Timothy, aged eight, and Elizabeth, aged 11, trick-or-treating. They hit a couple of houses where nobody would come to the door and they got a little bit frustrated. O'Brien told the kids to hit up the next house while he stayed behind for a bit. The kids were able to grab some candy at the next house and afterwards, their dad caught up with them, bringing some pixie sticks that he had gotten his hands on and tossed them into their bags. Towards the end of the night, he gave his neighbor's two kids each one of the same pixie sticks, along with one more to each of his own kids and one more to a boy from their church. Before bed, his son Timothy asked if he could eat some of the candy from his bag before bed, choosing one of the pixie sticks. He complained that it tasted bitter. His stomach started hurting, so he ran to the bathroom, where he began vomiting and convulsing. Timothy died on the way to the hospital in less than an hour. Now this is the part where the fear comes in. Parents all over town either started throwing away their Halloween candy or handing it into police in fears that their candy would probably be poisoned as well. The autopsy revealed that the pixie sticks he ingested contained a lethal amount of potassium cyanide. The authorities retrieved the rest of the pixie sticks that were handed out to the other kids, luckily none of which had eaten them yet. The boy from their church had tried to eat the candy, but by some stroke of luck, he couldn't undo the staple that held it shut, and he fell asleep with the candy still in his hands before he could even open it. All five of the sticks contained the same cyanide, Timothy's containing enough to kill two adults, while the others contained enough to kill three adults over each. O'Brien told the police that he didn't really remember which house they got the candy from, but given that they had only gone to a couple of houses before it started raining, the cops smell a strong scent of bullshit. None of the other neighborhood kids had ended up with this candy. Once O'Brien pointed the house out that he claimed to have gotten the candy from, the police were able to find that the man who lived there didn't return home from work until nearly midnight that night. Police soon uncovered O'Brien's massive debt. In typical fashion, he had taken out $10,000 life insurance policies on each of his kids in the previous month. In the days leading up to Halloween, he took out further $20,000 policies. He had also visited a chemical supply store shortly before Halloween. Robert O'Brien had obviously poisoned the candy himself. He planned to score $60,000 in life insurance from his two kids, and had just given the other kids some poison candy to cover his tracks. He was arrested a week after Halloween and indicted on one count of murder and four counts of attempted murder. Several associates confirmed that he had been asking around about how much cyanide it takes to kill a person and where to buy such chemicals. During his son's funeral, he had been gushing about how he was going to use the life insurance to go on a vacation and buy some luxury items. O'Brien brought up all the stories and legends of poisoned Halloween candy being handed out to kids in hopes to sort of demonstrate his possible innocence, as if this were a real thing that happened and occurred often. However, there had been no documented cases of it even happening up until this point. It took the jury only 46 minutes to find him guilty of all charges, and only about an hour longer to decide on a death sentence. His wife divorced him, and her new husband adopted their daughter. After a long, lonely stay on death row, O'Brien got executed in 1984 by lethal injection. He maintained his innocence all the way up to his last words, in which he forgave all the people involved in his death. 
A crowd of 300 people gathered around the prison during the execution, screaming trick or treat as he died, all while passing out candy to anti-death penalty protesters. All thanks to this guy, all of those old stories of poisoned Halloween candy were finally validated and parents began to seriously worry. But what they don't really realize is that it was an inside job done by the parent of the victim. Either way, the ripples of this case are still felt to this day. Thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, try not to get killed this Halloween. One good way not to die is to stay inside and watch more YouTube videos. Preferably some of mine. So I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.